Hey, what's up guys? Joker here. Today we are finally going to be getting a look at a custom RX Vega graphics card in the form of the Red Devil RX Vega 64 from Power Color. It has been nearly four months since RX Vega launched back at SIGGRAPH and we have all been waiting for custom cooled variants from the add-in board partner cards. Up until now, we've only really seen the Aces RG Strix out in the wild in very limited quantities to review outlets, but it's pretty much been impossible to find for actual normal consumers out there in the market looking to pick up a Vega card that is not a reference model. So really we've just kind of been sitting on our hands and waiting and now it is finally here with the Red Devil card from Power Color. And hopefully this is kind of a sign of things to come and we'll start seeing more custom cards coming in the very near future as this is officially launching today, the day you're seeing this video on November 29th. Power Color has told me that this card is launching at an MSRP of $599 and over on Newegg they're expecting to have a mail-in rebate for $50 but of course with RX Vega and really any graphics card right now of course the pricing could possibly vary based on availability as well as third-party sellers possibly raising the prices from there so you may not be able to readily find these cards at $599 at launch but we'll really just have to wait and see of course I'll leave links down in the description below to where you can pick it up on your favorite e-tailers. But let's go ahead and take a look around the Red Devil Vega 64 and see what Power Color has done that's going to make this stand out from maybe some of the other added board partner cards out there. As you can see, it's got a really nice red and black shroud. The black shroud going, the red and black shroud going around this does feel to have a uh, very premium metal metal feel to it. So really, really nice, solidly built. We've got a black backplate on here with the Red Devil branding, and this is a two and a half slot card. So it is an absolute monster. Without screwing this thing in, I was experiencing some GPU sag, so make sure you screw this thing into place. Otherwise, it could definitely start dipping a little bit inside of your system because it has some serious weight to this thing. It is massively heavy and very long as well. Now, on the side of the card, we do have a Red Devil LED, which is, lights up red, which you can disable with a switch on the side of the card. So if you want, you can toggle that on or off based on your personal preference. There is another switch on this card, which I think is a lot more interesting and is going to make this appeal to overclockers out there, as it is a triple bio switch. That's right. You can switch between three different BIOS modes on here, which do not adjust the clock speed on the card at all. Power Color had told me that AMD is limiting the add-in board partner cards to a maximum clock speed of 1607 megahertz. So that's kind of messed up that they are being limited with how far they can push these cards out of the box. But thankfully you will be able to go ahead and manually overclock these yourself. And having a triple BIOS switch is gonna be awesome for people that wanna get in there and maybe flash the BIOS and do a custom one or maybe LN2 then you are going to have a really good safeguard in this. So if you do happen to mess up on the BIOS flash, you can go ahead and just switch over to one of the other modes and maybe reinstall the original BIOS if you were smart enough to save it ahead of time, which you should definitely do if you do plan to get into BIOS flashing at all. But since there's a triple BIOS switch, this should really make it a much safer experience for having to flash the BIOS or anything like that for extreme overclockers out there, which is probably going to make this appeal to a lot of enthusiasts in the market. For the power connection, they are still using two 8-pin power connectors, so nothing different really from the reference design. I would like to comment on the positioning of the two 8-pin power connectors, which are recessed into the backplate, which is kind of odd, honestly. I'm guessing this was, you know, just, the, I'm guessing they had to do this for the length, the, the width of the PCB, and based on the fact that the rest of the card is so much thicker, but it made it really difficult to get the 8-pin power connectors in, since I was using standard 6 plus 2 power connectors, which most people probably are. I mean, if you do get some custom sleeved cables that are just a solid 8-pin connector, it's going to be pretty simple. You just slide it right in and you'll be good to go. But with a 6 plus 2 pin where you're kind of having to hold those pinched together in such a small tight space, it can be rather troublesome getting them in there. But thankfully for most people out there, you're probably just going to plug it in and then leave it and then it won't be an issue. But for someone like me who's swapping out graphics cards all the time, it certainly was a little bit of a pain in the butt having to do these connectors over and over again with how difficult it was to get my fat sausage fingers in there. Now, I mentioned the triple bio switch. This does have three different modes, and as previously stated, it does not adjust the clock speed at all, but rather it adjusts the target temperatures as well as the power limit on the card. So with the OC mode, which is what it ships with at default, it raises the target temperature to 70 degrees Celsius and increases the power limit to 260 watts. 
The cool mode puts it at a target temp of 65 degrees Celsius and also increases the maximum fan speed on the card. And then lastly, the silent mode has a target temperature of 80 degrees Celsius and it reduces the power target to 220 watts. Now I did all of my testing on the Red Devil Vega 64 overclocked. So to do that, I had the power limit on the card increased by 50%. So I had the slider pushed all the way to the right in MSI Afterburner. I also increased my frequency on the card by 5%, which I had to do in the Wattman software from AMD. None of the core clock adjustments that I made in MSI Afterburner would register. So I had to stick with a frequency increase percentage within Wattman on at 5%. And the memory, I was able to increase that as well, up to 1,050 megahertz, and that overclock was completely stable through all of my testing. I did everything in one run without the system crashing at all. Once I did get the overclock dialed in, I did have it at 6% for a while, and a couple of games it ran smoothly, and then I started to get crashing, so I had to dial it back to 5%, and then it was smooth sailing from there, so really no issues at all once I did get that overclock dialed in. Now, for power consumption, I did want to go ahead and let this run through on the Heaven benchmark, which I did for just over 30 minutes, and I measured the power draw using GPU-Z, and I was able to plot that data here for you now. And after 35 minutes, roughly, on the Heaven benchmark, the average power draw with my overclock put in was 312 watts. So pushing a lot of power out of this Vega 64 graphics card for sure. And with the same overclock dialed in on the Heaven benchmark, I saw an average core clock speed of 1633 megahertz, although that did vary based on, you know, different titles. Some games would kind of run up over 1600 megahertz, getting up to around like 1650, while other games would hover around 15, 1550 to 1600 megahertz. So your mileage may vary on your, on your clock speeds, depending on which game really that you are playing. So just be aware of that if you do pick up one of these cards or probably any Vega cards, honestly. For my test system, I was using my frame murder build with the i7-7700K overclocked to 4.8 gigahertz. So that shouldn't bottleneck us at all in terms of our testing. And I did have 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM in there up at 2933 megahertz. And for power efficiency sake, I was using a 1000 watt platinum rated power supply from Be Quiet. So that shouldn't be an issue, issue at all as far as the power is concerned with as hungry as Vega 64 is for its power. I wanted to make sure that we had a good power supply running this card for all of our testing. And I did test the Vega 64 up against my GTX 1080. It's a Founders Edition card, which I did have overclocked as well. And I don't see any limitations, honestly, with the fact that it is a Founders Edition. I'm still able to overclock that card to over 2 gigahertz. So for the OC on the GTX 1080, I had an additional 200 megahertz on the core and 300 megahertz on the memory. And then, of course, the power limit slider was increased as far as it would go in Afterburner on the GTX 1080 as well. So we've got both of these cards in a head-to-head -head showdown overclocked as far as they can go, Vega 64 and GTX 1080. So let's take a look at the showdown where I benchmarked DirectX 11, DirectX 12, Vulcan, and UWP titles. So we've got a good range of games here that we are testing. Now I'll start off with Rainbow Six Siege, which was honestly one of the very few titles that Vega 64 did end up pulling a victory in. The rest of the games here, besides Wolfenstein 2, it was a clean sweep across the board for the GTX 1080 by a rather impressive margin, I would say, as well in all of the games that I benchmarked here with just maybe just a few titles where it was kind of, you know, uh, just kind of really close. But for the most part, it was a clean sweep across the board for the GTX 1080. So in Rainbow Six Siege here, you can see that it is running much better. All of the side-by-side -side comparisons that I'll be showing you here were run at 1440p on Ultra settings. All of my benchmarks were done at Ultra. I tested at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. Other games where the Vega 64 took advantage was in Wolfenstein 2. That won by a significant margin, probably the biggest margin of all, as you'll be seeing in the graphs here in just a minute. And The Division was also a very close game. The Vega 64 did edge it out in some resolutions, um, but not all of them. And then all the rest of the games, though, was a victory for the GTX 1080 in 7 out of the 10 games that I tested. So it still looks like right now the 1080 is a better buy compared to Vega 64. 
I'll go ahead and throw up the graph now. We'll start off at 1080p average FPS and I'll be showing you guys the 1% lows in a moment as well as 1440p and 4K. I'm not gonna go through every graph in you know, minute detail, but I'll leave them up long enough so you guys can pause if you wanna look through all of the different numbers and all of that. But here's the 1080p ultra setting averages and you can see that, like I said, the Vegas 64 did win out in Rainbow Six Siege and Wolfenstein 2. Wolfenstein 2, I did kind of expect as it is a Vulcan, a Vulcan title, and those tend to run much better on AMD graphics card, and it won by a significant margin, getting an average of 196 FPS versus the 144 FPS of the GTX 1080. So a very big victory there in Wolfenstein 2. It's just too bad we don't have more Vulcan titles, otherwise they'd really make these AMD cards shine. Uh, even in DirectX 12 titles like Gears of War 4 that we see the you know, Vega 64 falling behind where they are. They do tend to usually run a little bit better in DX12, but in Gears of War 4, that just simply wasn't the case. With Forza 7, we did get really close. That's the other UWP title that I tested in here. Only fell behind by 2 FPS. So very close in Forza 7, but Gears of War 4, strong advantage for the GTX 1080. Uh, Middle Earth Shadow of War, once again, really big advantage for the 1080, winning by 102 FPS to 87 FPS. Uh, Sniper Elite 4, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and The Division. I tested all of those titles in DirectX 12, and only The Division did show a very small advantage to Vegas 64, but Sniper Elite 4 and Rise of the Tomb Raider were both wins for the GTX 1080, and Sniper Elite 4 is an AMD sort of optimized title. They really pushed that game a lot in a lot of the marketing material, so I was kind of surprised to see that NVIDIA won in that title as well. And Prey was another one of those games that has kind of, you know, has the AMD splash screen for Radeon and RX cards. So yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, big, big win again there for the GTX 1080. And then Ghost Recon Wildlands kind of rounds out the list there, pulling in another victory for the GTX 1080. I'll go ahead and throw up the 1440p averages right now where we're not really seeing a big variance compared to what we just saw in the 1080p numbers, really just, you know, once again, a victory across the board for the 1080, apart from the few titles that I did mention. And that continues also, of course, in 4K. And I'll go ahead and flash up the 1% lows here now so you guys can get a quick look at those. If you want to go ahead and, like I said, if you want to look through all of these in a granular level of detail, feel free to pause, take screenshots, whatever you want to do to go ahead and sift through those numbers. But there it is. That is the averages and the 1% lows of all the numbers that I got with the testing methodology that I mentioned, both cards overclocked inside my 7700K system. And yeah, the T GTX 1080 is just right now, it's still the better buy when compared to Vegas 64, because you can find 1080 cards anywhere from 500 to $550. Um, they are listing the MSRP at 499, but really you can only find like one card. It's like a, like not even a reference, but like a blower style card. I think it's from Gigabyte. You can find that for like 500 bucks. Not the best one to be picking up, honestly. But Pascal is just so power efficient that it's really not even that much of an issue because even the reference card here was able to keep up and, you know, beat the fully custom Vegas 64 card. So I'm not too sure, you know, who these cards are for, who's picking up the Vegas 64 cards because 1080 just right now still seems like a much better purchase and... It's not really any fault of power color with the Red Devil card because they've done an excellent job of being able to cool Vega 64. I didn't, you know, through most of my testing, I was seeing the, the GPU at around 62 degrees Celsius at a maximum. It was only Gears of War 4 that I actually saw the temps get up, um, you know, close to 70 degrees. But that was really the, the highest point that I saw. Even on the Heaven benchmark, after a 35-minute run, it was sitting at 60 to 62 degrees Celsius. So power color themselves have done an incredible job at putting out a cooler that can actually keep Vega 64, you know, in check as far as its temperatures are concerned. And to add to that, the triple BIOS, which makes this card pretty much an overclocker's dream if you want to be able to flash BIOSes and all of that. But still, at the end of the day, the GTX 1080 right now is just the better purchase. It is a more affordable card. You can find them much more readily available out in the marketplace. And it, as you can see, it beats the Vega 64 pretty handily, apart from a very few select titles like Wolfenstein 2 with Vulcan. So unless Wolfenstein 2 is the only game you're going to ever play, which is just not practical, the 1080 is still the better purchase right now at this point in time. Maybe we could see some driver revisions going forward into the future from AMD that can maybe improve this. I'm hopeful for that. Maybe we could see some improvements, like I said. 
but we will just have to wait and see on that. If we do see any massive driver improvements going ahead in the future that are sort of publicized, I'll certainly be sure to go back and retest and update you guys on that as accordingly. Um, but let me know your thoughts down in the comments below on the testing here with the Red Devil RX Vegas 64. Now that we do have custom add-in board partner cards, are you gonna go out and pick one of, the, one of these cards up, or have you already made your purchase decision and you're settled with the GTX 1080 or some other card out there? Or maybe you're waiting for Navi or Volta, or maybe possibly Ampere, which is the next rumored architecture from NVIDIA, which might not even be Volta. So we'll just have to wait and see on that, like many other things. But I'm gonna go ahead and get on out of here, guys. Once again, once I can find links available for this card, I'll be sure to leave it down in the description below over to Amazon or Newegg, wherever it's available. Um, if you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Leave a like on it down below and subscribe if you're not already. And don't forget to hit that notification bell as well for all of the future GPU videos on the channel so you never miss a moment of content. And I'll catch you guys next time.